We've seen how the Harley Davidson Sportster XL rose from veritable insignificance to world domination. We've even glimpsed its prehistory, the Model K of 1952, which Alan Girdler called the Apprentice Sportster. It actually emerged in 1957 with the launch of the all-new Harley Davidson Sportster, which in fact wasn't particularly successful or impressive. But like many of the most remarkable and inspiring automotive ideas, while the first iteration may not have set the world on fire, for those who really took the time to understand, it was a very special design indeed. Humble enough at first glance, but therein was contained all the necessary ingredients for unimaginable greatness. In less than a decade, that humble sportster had achieved the seemingly impossible. By 1965, the Harley-Davidson Sportster XLCH became the fastest and most powerful motorcycle in world production. It was able to propel itself to an incredible 122 miles an hour. In 1970, Calvin Cal Rayborn launched a massively modified Sportster to a staggering 265 miles per hour, claiming the motorcycle world land speed record in the process. The unassuming sports to XL from 1957 had truly become the greatest motorcycle in the world. But the world in 1970 was very different from the world of the 1950s from whence the sports to emerged. In Great Britain, the 1950s were all about recovering from World War II. The 1960s were about rock and roll and consumerism and the pill but the 1970s would become none of these optimistic, hedonistic things. The United States had enjoyed unprecedented economic growth after World War II, but civil rights injustices and massive anti-war protests had shown the American dream to be just one of the great and terrible facets of the bright, shining lie. In Great Britain, the euphoria of the swinging 60s just fizzled out. If the term swinging is most clearly reliant on wealth, then the fizzling out actually began right in the middle of the 60s. Harold Wilson became the British Prime Minister in 1964 and inherited a huge trade deficit of £800 million. Economists apparently advocated the urgent need to devalue the pound, but Wilson refused, recognising that devaluation would adversely affect the poorest in Britain and the British Commonwealth the most. However, in his first cabinet meeting after election victory, the reason he and Chancellor James Callaghan decided against devaluation was because Wilson didn't want Labour to become known as the party of devaluation. This was perhaps a stereotypically short-sighted and self-serving political decision. To many, it only ensured a future economic crisis which came with a vengeance in the 1970s. As unemployment and inflation began to rise alarmingly, an inevitable conflict arose between the new Conservative government under Edward Heath and the trades unions. Endless strike action crippled the country for years, but the miners' strikes of 1972 and 1974 rang the death knell for Heath's government. Because Britain's power stations were nearly all coal-powered, the miners' strikes led to severe power shortages, and between January and March 1974, the infamous three-day week was imposed. This restricted industrial and commercial electricity usage to just three days each week, meaning that nearly all places of work shut down for the remainder, although essential and emergency services were maintained. Living in Maidenhead in Berkshire, I can clearly remember the long, dark nights and the rush for the candles when the lights and the television suddenly went out. As a child, the loss of power was often little more than an exciting element to the evening. We would be forced together as a family and the strange intimacy facilitated by the candlelight could be great fun. For mum and dad though, it must have been tortuous. No hot water, no cooking or cups of tea, 
and no heating during the long winter months. Britain was a cold, dark and miserable place in the early 1970s. Unsurprisingly, Edward Heath's Conservative government collapsed. In 1974, we had two general elections, which eventually resulted in one Margaret Thatcher becoming Prime Minister. In Great Britain in the early 70s, nobody was buying much of anything, especially motorbikes. America was faring little better. By the late 1960s, the US dollar, like the British pound, was overvalued and in 1971, stringent economic measures were introduced known as the Nixon shock. Even though their respective situations were very different, America was facing some of the same socio-economic pressures as Britain with rising inflation and unemployment. Although President Nixon's actions brought some relief initially, the subsequent recession of the mid-1970s was made all the worse by these measures. It seems that in the USA during the 1970s, few people were buying motorbikes. In this, episode number 5 of the history of the Harley-Davidson Sports to XL, we come to an outlandish dichotomy because, in the 1970s, the Sportster actually becomes a mere auxiliary in its own history. For now, unbelievably, the greatest motorcycle in the world has, in 1971, to relinquish the centre stage for the shadowy wings. History, it seems, does not respect anyone or anything, no matter how great. We saw in the last episode that the Harley-Davidson Motor Company was in dire straits during the 1960s. Low sales, and therefore profits, meant that the motor company was under great financial pressure. A lot of this pressure came from the inside, the Davidson and the Harley families. They'd expanded greatly since the first three Davidson brothers and William Harley first incorporated the Harley-Davidson Motor Company in 1907. In the wonderful Harley-Davidson The Complete History, Greg Field describes the joint expanded families as a clan, but by the late 1960s a rather unhappy one. Each clan member depended on the motor company to protect and increase their fortune. But their respective individual fortunes were under threat because that company was performing particularly badly. What Field calls the clan chieftains were forced to raise capital in 1965 by making shares available to the general public for the first time in the history of the motor company. Although I said in the previous episode I couldn't find any details of this share issue, even a perfunctory re-reading of Field's The Shovelhead Era reveals some very useful information. Nearly 100,000 shares were offered, which enabled the company to invest in its factories in America and Italy. In 1960, Harley-Davidson had purchased 50% of the Italian lightweight motorcycle manufacturer Air Mackey. Although the years 1966 to 1968 were the most profitable in the motor company's history, according to Greg Field, it was not enough for the clan. On the 18th of December 1968, a shareholders' meeting resulted in a huge majority voting for a merger with American Machine and Foundry, or AMF. On the 7th of January 1969, the AMF shareholders rubber-stamped the deal, and according to Field, inside members of the Harley-Davidson clan advised each other to sell quickly, and they did okay, but those who didn't sell saw their fortunes decline with AMFs. The Harley-Davidson Motor Company was now wholly owned by another company. When AMF took over Harley-Davidson in January 1969, the motor company was offering two Sportster models, the XLH, a touring bike, and the XLCH, the sports bike. The touring Sportster was better equipped than the lightweight sport version, and the sportier XLCH sold 5,100 units in 1969, compared with the more expensive XLH touring version, which sold 2,700. By now, the various options for each model even included things like a large or small petrol tank, so the actual differences between the two models were small. 
The XLH touring version had better electrics, including an electric starter, but otherwise it was difficult to tell the XLH from the XLCH. When, in 1970, the sportier model got the electrical system from the touring model, and the touring model got the same headlamp cowl assembly as the sportier model, the two marks were more or less indistinguishable. The engine cases changed slightly for both models to reflect the electrical changes. In 1970, the boxy magneto atop the XLCH right-hand cases was dropped in favour of the cylindrical points and coil distributor of the XLH. The following year, 1971, this was redesigned again and moved inside the engine cases for a much cleaner look. Numerous small technical changes to the Sportster were introduced in the first two AMF years, and the new owners were content to support the Sportster XL line because it continued to sell very well. 1969 Sportster sales were 7,800, rising to 8,500 in 1970 and over 10,700 units were sold in 1971. From the get-go, Alan Girdler says that AMF invested a ton of money in HD's manufacturing plants, which inevitably means that they expected a good return for their money. But the AMF investment was laser-focused on updating the Harley-Davidson manufacturing facilities and practices. This left very little for extending or redesigning existing models. William G. Davidson, grandson of founder William H. Davidson, joined the motor company in 1963 at the invitation of his father, William H. Davidson, then H.D. President. Willie G., as he became known with great affection, was tasked with establishing the company's first design department. Long before this, though, Willie G.'s first contribution to Harley-Davidson appeared on the inaugural 1957 Sportster. He designed the circular tank badge with the offset Harley-Davidson logo. But this was all unofficial. Willie G was effectively moonlighting back then. By the time AMF had bought the company, Willie G and his styling department had a great deal to do and very little in the way of resources to do it with. In 1970, they were tasked with updating the Sportster so it could compete with the new threat, the Japanese superbike. His idea was to add a boat tail as a $60 option for the Sportster, presumably his interpretation of the tail sections from those Japanese superbikes, like this gorgeous Kawasaki H2750 from 1972. Whilst acknowledging that it may have been too extreme, Willie G actually writes fondly of the boat tail design, implying that it was somewhat ahead of its time. Either way, nobody bought the boat tail option, although these bikes are highly collectible today. Despite the sports to boat tail failure of 1970, the option was offered again in 1971, and it failed to sell once again. Undeterred, Willie G took said boat tail and added it to a completely new model, the Superglide. New, of course, is only Harley-Davidson new, which was even less new than usual, given the constraints on design budgets at the time. The story, according to Greg Field in The Complete History, goes like this. There was Willie G, innocently wheeling a sports to front end down to the styling studio, when he turned a corner and BAM! He ran smack into another guy, wheeling a forkless FLH the other way. Willie G took it all back and started bolting it together. For a third time, the boat tail design, which Willie G called racily, was a commercial failure. Nobody bought it because nobody liked it. But the marriage of the two model lines was a different matter. The FL bikes were, and remain, the traditional, huge, Harley-Davidson touring models. The humble Sportster was a smaller, cheaper, and much more manageable bike for the lowly working man or woman in the street. Thus, a small and light front end made it to a big, heavy chassis... gave birth to a whole new genre of motorcycle, the Cruiser. So, the FL Touring Model Letters 
were combined with the XL Sportster model letters, and lo, the legendary FX was born. The FX model remains hugely important to this day, more than 50 years later, and they carry legendary names that have etched their way into Harley-Davidson folklore. Low Rider Wide Glide and Fat Bob AMF is the acronym for American Machine and Foundry, a company which began in 1900. The company became hugely successful, making everything from domestic appliances, bombs to nuclear reactors. In 1901, a long and successful history began in Pennsylvania, with a factory being built in the town of Hanover, and later another about 15 miles away in Glen Rock. During World War II, a factory was built about a dozen miles north of Glen Rock, itself a mile or two east of the historic town of York, Pennsylvania. This was a munitions factory, producing, among other things, Beaufort's anti-aircraft guns. AMF bought this factory in 1964 and produced such things as propane tanks, snowmobiles, rocket engine and bombs for the US Air Force from the wildly diverse production lines. By the late 1960s, the factory complex sprawled to a monstrous three quarters of a million square feet. By the early 1970s, however, things had taken a turn for the worse for the York County factory. Cheap foreign imports meant that production was moving overseas, and the American war in Vietnam was finally ending, which reduced the need for Air Force bombs. The York factory was, more or less, sitting idle by 1972. AMF had installed John O'Brien as president of Harley-Davidson, and in October 1972 he announced that Harley-Davidson chassis would be built in the York factory while the engine manufacturing would remain in Milwaukee. According to Jim McClure, writing in the York Daily Record in 2014, the first motorcycle produced in York was a Sunburst Blue Sportster XLCH serial number 4A600000H3, which rolled off the production line on 2nd of February 1973. The reasons for the move were perfectly sensible. Tom Gelb, who became the Harley Davidson Manufacturing Engineering Manager, says that Harley was still using hand spanners on the production line at Milwaukee because there was no money for pneumatic tools. AMF needed to invest millions in order to upgrade production from what Donny Peterson calls dinosaur technology, and they already had huge facilities in York which needed completely repurposing. The traditional Milwaukee manufacturing base was not overlooked either, because in April 1974, AMF announced a huge $5.5 million investment in machine tooling for the engine factory. But this was no free ride. If AMF were going to spend the money, they required a deal more than a pound of flesh. Their philosophy seems to have been somewhat simple to the point of naivety. They seem to believe that if they made one item and sold it for one dollar profit, then they could make two and generate two dollars profit. Thus, in 1970, which was AMF's first full year of owning Harley-Davidson, 16,000 motorcycles were produced. In 1972, that number had more than doubled to 34,000, and by 1976, that number was 48,000, a threefold increase in just six years. The Harley-Davidson Sportster XL, just a bit player in its own history at this point, was about to be pushed even further into the wings of history, but only temporarily, obviously. Because the motor company was embroiled in the complexities of the AMF takeover between 1969 and 1972, it was just not able to develop the model lineup as it might have wished. To me, with the benefit of half a century's worth of hindsight, it seems that this was a time when history was shaping the Sportster rather than the Sportster being able to shape history. It also seems like a strange, rather uncomfortable time of transition for the illustrious Sportster. Where it had become the mightiest and the fastest, 
pure performance had far exceeded the now venerable old Sportster platform because the Japanese marks were so far ahead. What would the Sportster be in the modern world? The Harley-Davidson Sportster needed to redefine itself and in the 1970s, Willie G's design team were taking some odd, not to say bizarre, stylistic turns. For me, it seems like the Sportster was being led astray, but again, only temporarily. The minor changes of the previous couple of years underneath the bonnet, or reluctantly the hood, were augmented with some solid and very welcome updates. By 1972, the performance gap between the Sportster and its Japanese rivals were widening so alarmingly, the Sportster had the most radical of changes imposed. Where the glory of the Sportster had always been attained with the hallowed 883cc engine, by 1972 the maximum performance possible had already been extracted from this displacement. To improve from here needed more, not least because the Sportster had gained significant weight over the years, along with all the new equipment and upgrades. The answer? was to widen the cylinder bores from 3 inches or 7.62 centimetres to 3.18 inches or 8.08 centimetres, thus increasing the ending displacement from 883cc to 1000cc. This new, larger engine required that the sports to be equipped with a new all-singing, all-dancing carburetta, which was the hugely popular Bendix Zenith. It's much better than the old Tillotson carburetor, but I've no idea why. Also new for 1972 is the inclusion of a proper wet clutch. Apparently this made for a stiffer, more difficult to pull clutch lever, but it was much more reliable than the old dry clutch. But again, I've no idea why. There was also a new oil pump this year, and this was when the points got moved to inside the right side engine case. 1973 saw the brakes upgraded from the dire old drum brake to a real hydraulically operated disc brake, at least on the front. This too was universally welcomed. The front end was upgraded to use Japanese-made 35mm KYB or Kayaba front forks, and new legislation meant that indicators and a throttle return spring were included. The frame was also tweaked a little for this year. 1973 saw William H. Davison retire, and 1973 saw yet more record sales figure for the Sportster when more than 20,000 bikes were sold. Although history can't be carved into neat parcels of time, it is easier to understand events when they're divided up neatly. Thus, the 1960s can be thought of very differently from the 1970s. In Britain and America, Different pressures and pains brought about by different crises, but with the twin evils of greatly inflated prices and even greater unemployment, were realities for both. In Britain, the first half of the 1970s were cold and dark. In America, racial and sexual discrimination were largely outlawed, but individuals were still forced to fight difficult personal battles every day. Industrial and urban decline in many areas struck a savage contrast to the great expansion of population and wealth in places like Florida and California. But at least the horrors of the Vietnam War were coming to an end. The Harley-Davidson Sports to XL was becoming swamped by the momentous events of 1970s history, but it was still battling on and winning, at least in the terms of sales. Few changes befell the great mark, other than what Donny Peterson calls the styling faux pas of the boat tail, until the Ironhead engine was enlarged to 1000cc. But the motor company was having to balance some tricky financial complications, as well as many and more difficult managerial ones with the AMF takeover. As we'll see in the next episode, although sales and profits had increased quite substantially, by 1973, more momentous events were about to hit the world. The Sportster was really just a product produced by a company in one specific country. If history wants to kick us in the pants, it will, and it did, in all the same ways for America and Great Britain, 
and in completely different ones too. Through it all, AMF were driving Harley Davidson forward relentlessly. Soon though, the AMF priorities would change and with them, Harley Davidson would find itself fighting the battle of its life. More complicated and nerve-wracking than the Great Depression of the 1930s, and more visceral and drawn out than the desperate buyout year of 1969. This affected the sportster in many ways, but one of them was surely more important than all the others. Eventually, but decisively, the sportster was finally able to escape the confines of North America. So it was in the 1970s that the greatest motorcycle in the world, belatedly but with great delight, finally found its way to Great Britain. Join me next time for episode 6 of the history of the Harley-Davidson Sportster XL.